Um, so I'll now hand over to Mark. I've actually managed to delegate the first 9am panel. <laughs> it's only taken me four days to do that. Um, pass over to Mark for the uh, Fostering Positive Vendor Relationships se um, session. Thanks, Alan, and welcome, everybody. So uh, I'm Mark Wilkinson, director of the Dirac HPC facility and based at the University of Leicester. But you, you all know that uh, by this stage of the week, I hope. Um, so before we start, this session is fostering positive vendor relations. And in order to do that, we thought we did have three extra panel members. So if Luke, Nigel and H could please come up, you're the three extra panel members. April Fool, April Fool. <laughs> okay. You can laugh, yeah. The, the, for the online people, everybody here thinks that was very funny. Um, so the, the purpose of this session is to discuss the importance of having good working relationships with the vendor community because as all of us know, none, neither the vendors nor the uh, DRI professionals are working in isolation and so there's a lot of experience uh, in the community and on, on both sides of how to work together and so the idea of the session was to try to uh, share some of that, discuss what works, discuss what doesn't work so that uh, more people can get involved in that. So hopefully the, uh, the, the session will kind of bring, make you think about things in a slightly different way, maybe give you some different uh, uh, ideas on how to approach uh, either side, whichever side you're, you're currently sitting on. Um, so we'll start by doing introductions as usual, and then uh, we'll go through some questions and uh, we'll open up to, to questions to the floor as well. So uh, maybe we'll start with Fiona and uh, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, Alan, for inviting me to appear on the panel. It's very nice to be here in Manchester. Uh, my background originally was in the Royal Air Force as an engineering officer and when I left I thought that I would go into engineering and I saw this exciting new world of IT, this was in the 90s, uh, went into an IT company in the defence sector and then uh, have always been at the leading edge of technology so wherever new things are coming in um, and being deployed that's where I've enjoyed being. And I found myself in um, high performance computing in the early 2000s with uh, a startup processor company in Bristol. Uh, and that's when I really got involved with this community. And uh, I have to say a lot of the people are still here uh, mm -hmm. that have been there for all that time. And I've been really pleased to hear actually that this week uh, many new people and younger people are coming into HPC, which is great uh, because it is a really exciting world. Uh, most recently, I was with uh, Atos, where we had the Bull Sequana supercomputer. Uh, prior to that, I was with Cray for quite some years, the, the godfather of supercomputing, if you like. And uh, I've been involved with some really exciting organizations in that time and many, many procurements, uh, some successful um, and some less so. So I'm very happy to join the panel and, and uh, answer questions. Thank you, Bianca. Thanks. Steve. Thank you. So, as uh, some of you will have heard from, from Wednesday on the panel, so I'm Steve Hindmarsh. I'm uh, very recently Head of Research Computing at the Norwich Bioscience Institutes. So that's a grouping of four institutes uh, on the research park, just, just uh, very close to UEA, um, which is the, the John Innes Centre, Sainsbury Lab, the Quadrum Institute and the Earlham Institute. Um, so that this is only week four, and they've, they've let, me, let me have a week off already, which is great. Um, before that, I was at the Francis Crick Institute in London for four and a half years as head of scientific computing and um, there I was leading uh, sort of a wider team across HPC, software engineering, machine learning, sort of database data services uh, and before that I had various roles in, in NERC, uh, latterly uh, at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology which we have a, a, a member of the, well, the, of the new, new version there so uh, it's great to be here. Thanks Steve and online I believe we have Robin Pinning. Good morning everybody. Um, so many of you will know me, I can't see the full audience, but many of you will know me already. Um, I'm the CTO, I'm currently the CTO at Hartree. Um, so I've got a long history in, in HPC in the UK and, and, and wider. Um, I originally started supporting, after my PhD, I originally started supporting HPC at, at, at Manchester uh, as part of the national service that we had there, which is a large Cray machine. Um, 
and I've been involved in lots of procurement exercises. Um, many of you will know that already. Um, Fiona will, <laughs> for a start. Um, yeah, so so um, I, I'm very much looking forward to this session. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Tobias. Yeah, 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 everybody here probably knows me. I'm Tobias Weinzel. I'm in Durham University. Uh, I'm usually not involved directly into the procurement, um, but we have a couple of systems here, for example, an NVIDIA Bluefield cluster. And this means that we have to work very closely with Malanox now, NVIDIA here, for example, to, to get first codes up on that thing. Uh, and I'm probably also here in my role as the, the PI of the Durham 1 API Center of Excellence. So we have a very close working relationship with Intel. Uh, due to that. Thanks, Tobias. And Alistair? Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Alistair Basden. I'm at Durham University and manage the Cosma supercomputer here, which is one of the DIRAC nodes. Um, and uh, yeah, I have to work very closely with vendors to, uh, to get the best value for money when uh, designing and building these systems. Thank you. So I think that's everybody uh, introduced. So the uh, first question is just to get the discussion started, really. Um, and as we'll ask everyone on the panel to describe a vendor relationship that works well. Um, you're encouraged to be general rather than specific, but you can be as specific as you feel comfortable with. Um, and so something that's working or has worked well and uh, the key factors that uh, made, it, made it so productive. I'll start with Steve. Sure. Um, so I think for people that know me, you won't be surprised to hear I, my, where I start is building building sort of relationships and trusted relationships uh, with vendors. Uh, often this can be over many years actually, so you know, with um, obviously uh, account managers and so forth move around. Um, but having having relationships with people that you actually you understand what they need, they understand what you need, uh, and and you actually trust each other. I think is uh, is hugely important to for that relationship to work. It's not just about for me. It's not just about extracting maximum value. Uh, no, you need to do that, but it's it, that shouldn't be at the expense of everything else. It should actually be. Um, it, it, there's a it, it's it's a two way transaction. Though, and any any business transaction always is. So I think good good communication is essential to that, so that you actually you know. You understand, and, and from my point of view, as, as open as you possibly can be on both, in both directions, to actually um, to make that work. And I think what we can offer, uh, you know, where this has worked really well in my experience, um, you know, say most most recently at the Quick, but now now in Norwich, we're starting those you know, or continuing those relationships, is what we can offer is a, an environment where there's you know, we've got really really interesting challenges to work on. Uh, and also for incredibly worthwhile causes. So we can, you know, we're working you know, across, across the, all sorts of fields. You know, there's obviously you know, there's human health, there's food security, there's un, you know, understanding the universe, you, know, you name it. There's so many really interesting challenges and incredibly worthwhile challenges that we were working on and, and supporting that we've given, we give the vendors the opportunity to come in and be part of that. And in my experience, they, they absolutely love that. Because it gives them something, it gives them a warm buzz, isn't it? like like it does for me, um, to, to be part of it. And so, and it, and let's face it, it's also fantastic PR. Uh, and I'm always happy for them to make the most of that. You know, if if it's a good relationship and, and we're getting you know, we're getting um, good, good service and good systems, I'm very happy for that you know, to to give give credit where it's due as well, and to you know, to share that. I think that works that works really well um, both ways. And of course, we also you know, we need and 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 get great no, fantastic pricing in return for all of that you know, we're not you know it's it's a really nice relationship but we're not you know, um we've we've all got very limited budgets and and you know, i'm well aware you know, in this sector the what we get for the amount we spend is fantastic and would be the envy of probably in, you know, any other any other sector um so it, it's that kind of you know, where, where it works well is that it's mutually beneficial you know, it's, it's built on trust but also for me, I think you, know, you have reasonable expectations and, and sort of sensible behaviour on both sides. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in you, know, you, tr you treat other people well, they'll, you know, they'll treat you well. And yes, there are times when you have to call people out, but generally you know, it, it's, it's being reasonable and open uh, on both sides. And I think that that's, that's for me, has, has stood me in really good stead for, you know, for long-term relationships. And, and also, obviously, as newer vendors come along, 
to, to you know, so that we get the best possible out of them, but also they get you know, they get something out of it as well. Thanks, Steve. Fiona, did you want to come back on any of those points? I, I, Steve has, um, has absolutely hit the nail on the head. So good communication and early on, the worst possible sort of um, tender process is where an ITT lands in the inbox and a response is expected where there's been no involvement beforehand. So I would second Steve's comments about um, staying in touch with the sales team. Sometimes as a salesperson, you feel unpopular. Uh, you don't want to pester people. But actually, um, if you think about normal life, when you want to buy something, then you do want to have a relationship with the salesperson. You do want to trust them. And you know that behind the salesperson or the account manager, there's a huge team. There's the technical architects, there's project managers, bid managers, and there's a whole hierarchy in the organization which can all bring benefit to the solution. Um, that also includes all of the subcontractors or the, the suppliers that form part of the whole solution. So um, I'm, I'm sure, in fact, um, and what one of the other panelists mentioned some of those. And um, as a primary vendor, say for example when I was at Cray or at Atos, then we knew all of those suppliers very well as well. We knew their roadmaps, we knew what was being planned. And I think as Steve said, it's very helpful to have those discussions early on. Um, and you might learn that there's something better. Um, it, you might have an idea of something that you think would be the solution, but maybe there's something better coming that you could wait for. Uh, so being very open in both directions is really helpful. And also, um, meeting up at places like supercomputing, uh, any opportunity to meet face to face is really beneficial because email never tells the whole story. If you send a question to uh, a vendor, they'll provide an answer. But if you manage to have a conversation with them, something else may come out of that that, um, that helps everybody. So absolutely, communication, long-term relationships, um, that old adage, people buy from people. Uh, at the end of the day, I know that the, um, the RFP responses are scored um, and priced, and there are lots of important criteria, but that is greatly helped by the long-term relationships um, before and afterwards during delivery and beyond. Yeah. Thanks, Fiona. So, Alistair, would you like to uh, pick up on that? And because uh, you've uh, a lot of experience of working on those kind of long-term relationships as well. Yeah, uh, I, I would. I would agree with what's been said. I think it is important to, to develop those good relationships, get to know the people that are on the teams, etc. One thing that I would caution against, though, is you don't want to be seen as being too close to them, and and you have to remember that there is a you know a commercial aspect to this, and that you 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 have to be very careful not to do favoritism. I think is what I'm trying to trying to say. You, you know, you you might have a prefer vendor, one that you work with well, one that you trust, but you do have to remember to give other vendors opportunities, um, which, 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 which is difficult. You know, if you've been working with someone for five years, um, then to change, to change vendor to someone else, it, it can be difficult. Um, but if it's in the best interest of the taxpayer, if the, if the relationship, you know, if there's potential for a better relationship elsewhere or, or better, better kit elsewhere, then you do have to consider that. Um, and you, you you have to remember you have I suppose you have to take a professional view that that it's um, it is it's part of what you do as your job. Uh, and do you have any advice for people who are in that situation where they maybe have a an incumbent and but are aware that there's a need to open up the competition? How anything from your experience of that of how to manage that? Be as I suppose be as gracious as you can. Um, and the, the incumbent, if you if you end up ditching them, they're obviously going to feel upset. You know, even you know, they 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 may be you know, if it's if it's a team that you work closely with for a long time, you know, they may feel personally hurt, even though it's on on their work life, their personal life. You know, these things are not always unintwined. Uh, and to try and maintain as well as you can uh, good contact with them, go forward so that so that the door's not closed for, for future, for, for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, um, Alistair, um, vendors, we, we in the vendor community recognise that and uh, we, you know, we understand that 
Um, I've been in both situations, of course, as the incumbent and as the, uh, the pretender wanting to be the incumbent, so we, we do fully respect that. And I think much has changed. Um, I, I, I don't know how many years to go back, but nowadays um, p there is a lot of professionalism in the relationship. So, yes, we might go out for lunch, but um, I think there is far less chance of... Um, confidential information being passed unnecessarily, that sort of thing. I think we are, everybody is meticulous now about um, following the rules. I would like to hope so, certainly in the community I know they are. So we respect those boundaries. Uh, Tobias, would you like to come in at this stage? Yeah, we are professional as if we never got ambushed with a cake. Um, there is there are three um, three three things in my opinion that are important to collaborate successfully, and that's the right timing, common goals, and the right people. And let me clarify what I mean because I think it adds, it adds something to what has been said so far, which is all, all correct. The first thing is timing. I found it absolutely essential that we get access to stuff we might consider to buy way ahead of time. Okay, so very often when when the uh, relations have not worked out greatly was kind of when the timing had been, well, we, we buy that stuff for you and then we help you make stuff up running. That that doesn't work. It has always good work, better at least, and we got access to the kit we think about buying or using way ahead of time at the vendor and try things out. So get the real stuff. I mean, usually when you buy a car, you would test drive it before, okay? But I think a lot of supercomputing stuff, or sometimes supercomputing runs the other way around. You first buy the car and then you drive it and you recognize that there's two wheels missing. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing that, that I find very important is have common goals. Um, it's all fair enough what has been said, but we have to admit that vendors have want to sell their stuff and we want to get science done. And even though we sell it as that, that we all in the same boat, those are two different objectives. And I found those collaborations particularly fruitful where we agreed on a common goal, where we had a common goal to work to, and the best goal, because that's one of the ultimate metrics in science, is papers. So uh, the best, best collaborations we had were those where we, where, we, where we tried to get very, very soon, even in the pilot phase, uh, papers out. And that uh, leads to my third point, um, it is important to get the right people in. Um, so nothing against salespeople, okay? I, I do think they are important, okay? All the architects. Um, most productive collaborations I have are, however, with the R&D teams. So it's very important that the, that you work together with, with sales and customer-facing divisions that are able and want to escalate any issues you face immediately to the developers behind the scene. Nothing is more frustrating than they say, well, we have opened an issue and we're going to take it and, and we're going to fix it eventually. That's, that's not what, what really helps you. You want to not only identify flaws, you want to work together with the people who built the kit to fix them eventually. And, and those are the three ingredients I, I think make up a really successful collaboration. Thanks, Tobias. So I think there, there's a kind of common themes emerging about communication, having the right people and having shared goals. So uh, Robin, would you like to pick up on, on any of those in, in, from um, that, the hard so tree experience? A number of things have already been, yes, yeah, so a number of, number of the points I was going to make have come up. I, I, would, I would probably characterize it um, where you go beyond the tran transactional and, um, and then it becomes a win-win um, a situation for both organizations. So I think that that engagement is critical because you've got to understand the, the nature of the vendor and what they want to do, where they're going and their ambition. Um, that's, and I think particularly when you're, you know, you're procuring and choosing a partner at scale, that, that's super important. Um, I think at smaller to medium scale um, facilities, you're, the value for money uh, takes on a different aspect. So this, we haven't raised this yet, but but uh, but I think that you, you might get you might say, well, okay, so we we want the best bang for the buck, um, which is different to value for money. You want you know you, you can go for cut price stuff, and maybe that that really suits your aims, right? Um, 
But if you're if you're aim, if you've got if you're more ambitious and that's the the mission of your organisation, then that that changes the nature of the relationship and changes changes um, how you might do that engagement and over the and the, the period of time over which you you will do that. Um, I think on a very basic level, I would also raise that you want to it, it goes beyond just sort of when you pay the money over and you you manage that relationship as you have it. And I think that you know good project management and good communication. I think this is you know Fiona raised this is critically important in these things. Thanks. So I'll open it up to the floor. Is there anyone would like to comment from the the floor before we move on? Thanks. Hi. So it sounded like from what. Uh, particularly what Spears was saying, there were two. There seemed to be like two different types of uh, projects you could say that you might have with a vendor. Where one, where you're kind of helping them a little bit in their R and D, kind of exploring something that's still slightly in development, and then there's sort of purchasing their more well-established, um, well-developed products. And I'm wondering to what extent you kind of have some strategic plan of, okay, so we're not that interested in what they're kind of developing and excited about right now, but we know that next year we want to buy their flagship doohickey. Like, and I'm wondering, does that kind of happen organically or is that something that you kind of plan for behind the scenes? So maybe I'll, I'll comment, I'll abuse my position and comment on that and then uh, ask others. Um, I think the best way to do it is organically. You need to have a, a you need to have a clear picture in your head of what it, what it is you want, because as several people have said, the, these partnerships work well, I've, I've found, when both sides have a reason. It doesn't need to be the same reason, but they both need a reason for this project to, to go ahead, whatever it is. And uh, as Tobias said, often the motivations are completely different, but that doesn't matter. You've got this one thing you're, you're trying to solve. Without that, if there isn't buy-in on both sides, one side will either end up doing all the work and feel annoyed, or the, the project just won't happen. It'll just peter out. So I think it's, it's not, for me anyway, it's not so important to have a, a, a clear step-by-step -step plan in advance, but at each stage, you have to kind of rev you have you need your overall strategy, and then for each stage of the relationship, you have to say right, this is why we're doing this now. So it's it's like any project. If you've lost the motivation for the project, it's probably going to not happen in the end. So, Steve, would you like to? Yeah, I think on that, that's a, that's a good, really good question. You know? So I think the way I would approach that and have approached that is, I have. Even though at any one time we might have actual kit in from a, you know, a small number of vendors, I would have relationships with lots of vendors and, and have regular discussions about you know, what they can offer, what's coming up. And often you know, these days, you often that often needs to be under NDA, um, but you can have briefings in terms of what the next generation is going to look like and these sort of things. So, so it's not I'm doing that as an ongoing thing. And that, uh, at times when you're nearer a procurement, obviously it, it, it's it's much more in focus. But I've got I've got a keen interest in in what's coming up, and also you know, that again sort of making that. Um, interest known so, so, so they, they, they're keen to share what they're doing as well um, but so you've always got a view of kind of what's coming down the line uh, and, and then you can um, know at, at times <clears throat> at times that'll be much more immediately relevant and other times it's good to know what sort of you know, what's coming down yeah here's a, an online question um, early on Alistair used the word value how can your vendor help make the case to administrators that something is good value rather than being the cheapest who would like to well I can, I can someone on Alistair do you want to comment on that as it was directed at you I can't do it since I used the word value yes, um to so to to the um you, you can build a, a whole portfolio of kind of value-added activities around a procurement. That's that's something that we do. So, um, you know, it's not just about getting the hardware in. It's also about the long-term relationship that comes with it. And and some of that can be very high value. It can be um, early access to a, a commitment to, to deliver for free, early access to new technologies, for example. Um, it can be sponsorship of PhD students, for example, things like that. 
can uh, and, and it, what it will be will depend on which vendor it is and what you're trying to achieve and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're, they're often very happy to do this. They can often tap into marketing funds to help do this. Now, it is very difficult and they certainly, most of the, the companies I work with, all of them, uh, have, been, have to be very careful with um, uh, um, not not um, blackmailing and abusing their position and being, you know, very much above the board. Um, so they're all very much aware of that and, you know, bribery, that sort of thing. They're very much aware of that. So it's not the case that they can slip your stuff for free that might be seen as bribery. So it has to be built into this long-term value um, relationship. Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, I was just going to say the whole thing about value and idea that often we dread kind of, or, or in the past I have been in environments where you know, the, the, the cheapest bid wins and that's a nightmare because it's not, you know, the, it, the cheapest bid is not necessarily the bid, it might meet the minimum spec and I guess this is where your scoring comes in, mm. you know, in and I, I would hope that those, those days are, um, well at least in my experience, those you know, I've not for a long time been pushed into the cheapest one just because it's the cheapest because they're often not the best and not necessarily fit for purpose but, but yeah, the, I guess the guard against that is, is to have um, well structured um, sort of scoring to make sure you're not just looking at this is the kit list uh, and who can provide it cheaper. Because I'm sure we've all had nightmare experiences that we can share separate over coffee or whatever <laughs> that we don't that we don't want to repeat. And, yeah. and I would agree that the uh, the content of the RFP, which doesn't just come out of the blue, I know, and takes a lot of um, construction work over a period of time, is to focus on things that will bring value so not just the PHBD sponsorships and things but um, other elements of the solution um, if you just send a kit list effectively in an ITT then it will be all about price and that's where you may end up with the unintended consequence of not the whole solution that you were really looking for so um, sometimes people um, get help with uh, constructing the RFP so that it does play better to a, a value solution rather than just the cheapest um, and back to the car analogy that Alistair made earlier, uh, or maybe it was Tobias, um, you know, they, we don't all drive the cheapest cars, and yet they all do the same thing. So we, in our own minds, write our own requirements um, and then choose the one that we want based on more things than just price. Otherwise, we'd all be driving identical cars, um, and they wouldn't be built in this continent, probably. So. I just well, no, I had a going over. Oh, sorry. Just, sorry, I, was, I, I think the it's absolutely key, as has been said, to get the value add part of the tender documents right. It's very easy for them to be so vague that you don't get anything useful uh, written down because the vendors won't know what it is you're looking for. If you just say we want we want value add and partnership activities, mm -hmm. give examples and. You know, it goes back to the, the earlier question about, you know, how do you, what, what should you be doing? Have a strategy, make sure you know what you think is valuable so that when, thing, and, and make that known to the vendor community so that mm -hmm. when they come with, if it's, if it's co-funding for a PhD, if that's the thing that would really make a difference to your project or your group, say, give that as an example. So. Be very open to things you haven't thought of, obviously that, that's important as well, but talking to the vendor community so you know the kind of things they can they can do, but you also know what they can't offer. Don't go into a tender expecting uh, miraculous things to be offered mm -hmm. if, that's not, if that's not reasonable. You know, you're not going to get you know, 10 million pounds of free kit on a 1 million pound procurement unless you've got a, a very long-term relationship already and it's, it's part of a, a well-defined program. So it's, uh, you've got to be reasonable in what your expectations are, but I think being clear is also, is also vital if you want good responses. So I think it was Robin and then Matt. Not Simon, oh, yeah. Simon sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm, you, you've half answered the supplemental question that I was going to ask with these value adds. Um, and I would ask the panel, are there, do you have any examples of how this has worked in practice in the past? Because it's all very nice to do these things. It's very hard though. So some examples for the audience, I think would be really lovely if you've got them. I think it's, uh, sorry. Okay. I was gonna say the, um, 
Something to remember is that uh, everything has to be costed into the overall solution. So um, if there's a large amount of, of added value, it's several PhDs, for example, then that needs to come off the cost of the rest of the solution. So the, again, unintended consequence may be a lower performing solution, less hardware, less software, etc. Uh, and also the, the added value can come not just there's the primary contractor who's actually um, responding to the tender, but it's all of their supply chain. So the relationships that they have um, are important as well beforehand. And it, it's an, an interesting game because they are often working with several bidders as well. So, and they may be often offering different things with different bidders because the relationships are different. Um, I don't want to name any names or, or refer to particular projects, but um, there is one not too long ago which was uh, particularly good in terms of um, the customer knowing what it was that they would v find valuable um, and then us as a bidder being able to um, bring a, a lot of different parts of the organisation actually. So I met different parts of my organisation uh, looking for these other things. Um, so it's not just the HPC team, it might be from the scientific community within, within the vendor that other things could be brought. Um, and the very first point Steve made was about communication. It was having those discussions early on, so before the paperwork actually came out, so that uh, when we as, a, as the responder um, were responding to the added value areas, we knew what was going to be valuable, um, and we didn't you know, offer something that um, looked great but had actually had no benefit to the, to the end community. Uh, and also remembering that the community is much more than just the team doing the procurement. Um, the, the user base can be very many, um, hundreds or even thousands of users, so sometimes understanding a particular part of the community that would benefit from something that, that we could offer. So it, it is a really difficult one. Yeah, I have to say the amount of time that goes into writing um, proposals, and um, it, it's not just an individual answer to each question, it's the consistency and continuity. Uh, in, you know, I myself... Um, Many people would contribute to it, but I would make sure that I'd read every word um, and that we supported every word of what we were putting in. Um, and that's at the point where it gets submitted. Um, but at that, by that time, there has been months or years of discussion beforehand to, to identify these things that would be useful. So. Thanks. Would any of the online panel members like to give examples? I, I can. Um, so... So Hartree is slightly different from, from, from many academic organisations and I think that the, where it's worked well for us is commercial links, um, where it, it works for both parties. So I think that, you know, and being specific about what you might want to achieve with that and then managing that uh, and is, is where it's worked best for us with vendors. Um, you know, and, and you know, that can, that can lead to um, working with other tech companies, so but, but uh, you know, so tech industrial, but, but the applied stuff is is kind of an interesting route as well. Um, <clears throat> I think also where it's worked well is where you end up in a co-design situation, and you end up um, being part of what's strategically important technically, and that's so I personally find that really interesting because you 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 get to have well be realistic about how how much of a, an influence you can be over that, but there's certain parts of that you, you, you really can engage with. Um, so so that's, that's where I find, find it most productive in the, in the, in the value-added activity. I, I, I think that another comment about the process um, of, of procurement, and I think you, know, you should really understand um, that full process. Uh, and be realistic about expectations. I think that's, this has been mentioned before by other panel members. Um, but but I think that um, y you can distort um, y you can distort your whole process if you get the balance wrong there. Um, and, and and then you're open to you know. So this is this is, you know. So this is very process driven. But you're open to, to sort of challenge on that. Um, I, I would prefer. You know, when specifying these, I would prefer to you avoid all those. So, it's Alistair's mentioned this, but avoid all those tricky situations. Alistair mentioned this before, um, and, and focus on the, the really productive stuff. Um, 
think with value for money is it's a, a quick comment on that one. It's kind of interesting what you value and what the organisation values. One or not, not every organisation is the same, so we all have slightly different aims. And just to add to that, Roman, I think um, so. Alistair. Uh, made the comment about the importance of, of value for money for uh, the taxpayer. I think the that doesn't always mean the cheapest solution. It sounds like it does, and you might imagine that it, it should. You know that that's the only thing you could justify to an auditor. But if you're clear about what it is you value and how that fits into an overall strategy for your team or your organisation, then it's it's perfectly possible to justify going for a solution that had some extra feature or some extra collaborative project alongside it and that that value um, even if it's hard to put a financial number against it you can you can find ways to to quantify that it's, it's an easy mistake to make that actually and I, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting because not all procurement people beyond the, the yeah. people like us really understand that mm -hmm. and, and can really try and make you go in a different direction so you you do need to to, to understand what you want and understand what the value is there and, and make that very clear. Sometimes that's within your own organisation. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another point to comment on is that maintain good relationships with your own procurement office because there will be a range of approaches uh, to procurement, some of which are very rigid and there are 10, 10 rules and you have to stick to those 10 rules some are much more organic and they understand the the process and where you can be flexible and how to you know sit down and have an open conversation about what it is you want to get out of the procurement mm -hmm. and then often you'll find there's someone in the procurement team is able to help you write the itt in the way that will get you the uh, the what you're trying to to get to i would say as a vendor as well it's really important for uh, for us to understand the whole process so uh, we we get to know the technical teams and the um, the people that are in this room pretty well but then we have to know and for our own bosses and our hierarchy we also have to predict accurately what activities happen even following selection and it um, I would say 100% of cases takes more time than expected <laughs> and a lot more effort than expected um, so when we come in and ask all the silly questions, um, who's this, who's that, who has to sign things, the reason for that is so that all of us understand, uh, particularly if there are tight timescales for um, perhaps spending money by the end of a, a, a financial year, that all of us are working towards that same goal. Um, and within the big organisations, uh, they... There are people that have to approve things that won't know anything about the project whatsoever. So if you suddenly put something in front of them and say, approve this by tomorrow, the chances are it will be no, and there'll be a lot more questions backwards and forwards, and suddenly delays are introduced. So, uh, you know, understanding that whole process very early on is, is pretty important. Well, they might be on holiday at a crucial time, which uh, is so something exactly. we had recently. Of any <laughs> yep. And also the suppliers. Um, so there are periods of time, like Christmas, um, around Thanksgiving for American companies in the summer for European companies in the whole of July and August, you can find that key people, uh, not just in the own in the, the primary organisation, but in the supplier organisations, exactly as you say, Steve, they're, they're not there um, or, or not available. So, so changes as well often come in even following um, a procurement. There'll often be some changes in the solution. And getting those sort of things through approvals, um, one needs to allow time for that um, as well. So. so it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, I think it's it's clear that you you get this long term relationship if you've got big bucks. If you're a director of a research centre and you've got millions of pounds to spend, you know that that's when the, these all these uh, interesting uh, value added things come along. But if you're an RSC and you're buying a uh, a one thousand pound workstation. No, it's going to be dumped in your desk, and that's it. So, where in between that spectrum does this process start? When do you start getting this relationship aspect? The people in this audience, is this all just pie in the sky? Um, I, th I think I'm not sure whether uh, <laughs> whether this answers that question. One of the RSEs can play and, and probably should play a very important role in procurement. And the first thing is when we look at procurements that 
don't work out that smoothly, then very often we haven't started where we should have started, and that's at the back. Okay, so I think successful procurements have a well-defined number of codes and benchmarks or signs that has to be delivered at the end. Uh, if you sit down and you say, this is the number of cores I want to have, then this will very likely go wrong. So just an example for procurement, it's years ago, so I'm not going to tell you who it is, but um, that went not that smoothly from my point is when the benchmark, the acceptance tests were phrased in, uh, well, Linpack and, and the likes. Uh, and we found out that the software stack by was not there. It was fine for those few benchmarks, but it didn't serve our needs. And that, that caused a lot of follow-up cost on our side, where we had to fiddle out how to configure the, the software stack, which actually should the vendor should have done at the time. So um, the, the error made here is that we didn't have well-defined benchmarks, and those can be and, and well-defined profiling uh, when we when we asked for the tender. Um, the, the sec and this is value for money, okay? That, that makes it then very clear why, later on why you run for a certain uh, thing. And the problem here, and this is, I thought that, and the th one thing, so that's the first thing. Second thing that you should probably try is to get the academics out of the room whenever possible, um, because a lot of these senior, you know, people who call themselves professors, but actually they're managers, but they always tell to, to tend to give you a solution rather than to ask the right question. So they will tell you because they're experts in literally everything, they're gonna tell you which kind of CPUs they want and how much memory they want, but, but that's not true, isn't it? You want to solve your science at the end. So try to get them out of the loop or ask them, what do you want to achieve, not how do you want to get there? So that would be the second thing. And this whole thing that I described has one big disadvantage and that's if you always follow that, then you will not do revolutionary new stuff so I'm absolutely sure if the UK drove all of its procurement only by what they want to achieve science wisely, we, for example, would barely have GPU machines, okay? Because a lot of codes that are in the, in the scientific computing community are not there yet to use them. So every now and then you have to do uh, with, together with the vendor, okay, you want to sell that eventually, okay? We want to get it in, um, but it has to work for us. And this is where you have to use your positive vent relationship to do some prototyping to find out what that, what that, can we construct a solution with your new stuff that serves us? Because eventually, I think uh, vendors want to get the contract, okay? But uh, my impression is that in this business, they also want to build cool stuff. They don't want to sell the mass thing. And, and, and this is a starting point for a, a, a constructive relationship. So I just want to come back on the point about getting and keeping academics out of the room or out of the loop. Um, I think there you, you qualified it later. I think the important thing is, in my view anyway, they should be very much part of the loop. They should be in the room, but it's really about asking the right questions and making sure that the, the information that you need, it, it's, it's the same as for any DRI activity, whether it's RSE activity or building a system or, or whatever. It's, as you said, the information that's needed is what the academics want to want to achieve. You find that out in a form that you can then use and generate the solution. So it's, it's about working together on it so that we don't go off, because we don't want only novel systems that are unusable. We, we need, we need a, a balance and, you know, the tier twos have been great as a way of bringing new technology in and allowing people then to, to explore those. Anyone else want yeah, to comment can on I, uh, going Can I just jump in? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, could I um, just, just kind of follow up from an academic point of view, really? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, us academics, we're kind of trained to be inquisitive and to try and understand and that sort of thing. And, and the example of, um, you, you know, the prof sort of specifying the CPUs that he wants and, and that kind of thing is, is actually very typical, I think. Um, so my question is, it would be nice to hear from the vendors, what are your views on how you can make HPC, because you know, we often talk about HPC as if it was a thing, and it's actually a very complex collection of things and people, um, but what, what do you think your role is in trying to make that a bit more transparent so that the end users understand a little bit more 
the nuances and complexities of, of the thing which ultimately their grants are going to fund? That's a really good question. And uh, I think, uh, again, in my experience, um, once a system is live, it's generally uh, has to be a compromise because you can't keep every single academic and every single user um, happy. And that's, as, as Mark said, why things like Tier 2 have come out and whether there are other systems that you can then use. Um, but I was always very willing to have our technical people meet with communities. Uh, so whether that's in workshops or at um, perhaps something at the at, at events, we're happy to we were happy to be intru invited into universities and speak to a group of people, um, and enabling people to be aware what's coming as well. Um, you don't always want to wait for the next uh, generation of technology, otherwise you never have a system, and you might have a system that's actually dying and that has to be replaced. So it is a compromise, but I, I think uh, fostering those. Si you know, other relationships apart from just the people doing the procurement and the people doing the selling is really important as well. Um, we, we can't solve all of your problems, that's for sure, but uh, we, we, can, we know a man or a lady who can, so we can probably bring those people into the, uh, the mix as well. I, I know when I was with Cray, there was a, an incredible performance team based over in America, and I got to know them quite well. And you'd know what their individual expertise was and maybe you would find um, somebody who wanted to talk to them and you can enable those, um, you know, those conversations directly. It may not um, change what the end solution is, but at least it enables you to know what's, uh, what's out there and what's coming. So, Steve, and then I'll come yeah, to you. Yeah, I'll just come back on, on Matt's question on value add and sort of where that cuts in. I obviously can't give you an exact answer, but I think there were two, for me, I think there were two elements to it. One of it is financial. So obviously, you know, if you're buying a your £1,000 PC or whatever, it, it, there's there's no margin in that anyway. I mean, there's a you know, tiny margin, so there's there's no there's nothing in it for the supplier in that in itself to give a lot of value add. If you've got a, a £1 million or however, whatever, a much larger contract, there's obviously more scope in there for value add. So that's one thing. But I think it's not just about that. So I think it's where I came back and talked about earlier about the opportunity for for vendors to get involved in really worthwhile projects uh, and, and the sort of loop, both for sort of PR but also for genuine wanting to make a difference. So I think you're the kind of the science case of why you're doing this, even for something that's quite small, if you can demonstrate that actually this is something, no, so we don't need to, we're not buying a massive thing, but this is part of, you know, this is why we're doing it, this is, you know, this is what it's going to do for, for the world or for whatever. No, if, if you can hook them in through the science case and actually you know, this getting part you know, being part of a, of a fantastic cause it doesn't have to be a high value project for them to actually say yeah actually we want to be part of this and, and from their point of view if it's not high value they might just say you know if, if they're that engaged in it it's not going to cost them a lot necessarily to also do so to say well they might you know, who knows they might say okay well we'll give you that or we, we can do these other things so so there's def don't just think it's about the money i'm sure you don't but you know, it, there is a real it, there's a genuine hook in terms of of, of, of what we're doing and that's as I said at the beginning that's part of the attraction for the you know, for the vendors in terms of, of why they enjoy working with us even though they don't make much money out of us they make a bit but it, it, it's being involved in those worthwhile things to do something to help but also obviously fair enough to, to, to then demonstrate and use that as part of their sort of PR to say this is what we're doing to help. You're quite right Steve you know case studies of of, of real successes are, are fascinating to all all of us um, and when it's a joint one that we've all been in it together, then that's you know, really exciting when we get those sort of stories and see that you've actually done some good with the systems. And I think this comes back to the point that Simon was asking about earlier, that um, the, uh, th th there's a certain amount of sales, I feel, from our side as well, in terms of think about what value we add to uh, whatever relationship we're talking about. So if you're going to a vendor, don't just say, I'd like to try my code on uh, some, some new thing that you're developing. Think about what you can do. Is it, you know, you can offer, we can write a white paper together talking about the performance of this type of algorithm on your type of hardware. So let them see that you can actually deliver something and that's certainly within Dirac, one of the things that has helped us with building these relationships is actually being clear that, you know, the, the bit that the, the, the partnership side, we will commit some effort to it as well. And so even as an individual RSE, I would say you can build up a, a track record of doing that by get involved when there are procurements 
uh, going on. See, you know, ask if you could be part of the team that's that's involved in it and involved in those discussions. You know, if if it's something that you're interested in, because certainly in Dirac, we've the RSC team has been intimately involved in the most recent set of procurements, much more so than we've ever done before, and it was extremely valuable. Um, so it's it's uh, you know, I think that you can get in at any level and then show that you can add value to that kind of uh, collaborative project. Uh, Marion? Yep. Lots of nodding here from the other particip um, panelists um, on your point. Um, yeah, so we've got a comment from Mike here, um, thinking about small scale purchases. I've always enjoyed those vendor researcher relationships where the relationship has been set indirectly between the vendor and the community at large. One which worked well for me, our group at the time, MIMUS, or MIMUS? Uh, was a cloud computer relationship negotiated between JISC and the vendors to create a UK-wide relationship. I then didn't have to worry about the complexity of the negotiation process and the account creation phase. Mm. No question, just a comment. No question, just a comment. So we've talked a lot about uh, things working well. Um, so maybe it's time to just inject a little bit of, uh, let's say, just realism rather than negativity. Uh, what things haven't worked well in, in the panel's experience and how have you uh, fixed or managed uh, those situations? So I'll, I'll give everyone a minute to, to think first. Is, is there anyone online on the online panel who would like to jump in on that? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, so I, I think that... So you, you pr you could probably consider this in two ways so one is that if you're not happy with the current relationship and that hasn't gone well um i th so so in that in that, in that situation you would make sure that you're communicating make sure you regularly uh, project manage the relationship and, and understand exactly you know what each side is committed to and be and just to, i would say that you know being really clear about things uh, and uh, so that's that's in an ongoing relationship where you've got current service with them um uh, and then thinking about you know how you 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 might remedy that in a in any future procurement um by getting the right the right balance in there uh, i think that you, you know so whether you had the right value you know whether, whether you had the right um value added um scoring in that in that particular procurement whether you really did get the value that that, that was meant to give you um you know you, in my experience you're constantly tweaking these things um you, you always learn from the previous experience and you, you constantly tweak them but but for a current relationship it's it's all about communication and understanding uh, the vendor team that you're working with So there were a couple of things that can immediately, so I'm normally really easy going, but there were two things that can really um, set things off on a bad foot. So one one is the sort of the traditional pushy salesperson, um, which fortunately is much, much less prevalent in the, in the kind of in our space, but it can exist. The other one is, is if he's very ill-informed or badly informed um, vendors so now that again that's that's unusual but can happen and I, obviously I do not expect everyone to know everything that's you know, clearly it's never gonna happen and I certainly don't um, but if you get someone who's clearly doesn't know what they're talking about and you know more than they do then that that conversation is not going to very la last very long <laughs> for me um, in, in where in more generally where things can go wrong as, as just been said no, sort of poor you know, where, if communication breaks down um, that that can be you know or unrealistic expectations and those sorts of things and it's sort of the opposite of all the good things that we talked about um, one one thing that i have found really helpful to to try and fix things is honest feedback and again that comes back to my approach of being as open and honest as i can be uh, and, and honest feedback whether that's about an existing relationship uh, or whether it's in time we've had i've had really good um, sort of feedback sessions with from unsuccessful tenders where i've said gone back and you know, talked to vendors and said actually you know, this is why it wasn't successful and, and these are the things that you might want to think about and work on for the future and they've been really really um grateful for that because obviously that helps them as well I'd like to 
Yes, I was uh, going back a little bit in time, but uh, a project where um, <coughs> it was uh, a number of phases, um, and the a future phase was going to be new technology, and uh, it transpired that that was going to be late. Uh, so that was when I really had to work particularly hard, I think, and be the buffer, and also the uh, the negotiator and the friend to everybody, so that communication was as clear as possible. There's no point hiding bad news. Um, so it was sharing it. It was also making sure that it was escalated within my organisation um, and that the right relationships were in place um, in, the, um, in the customer organisation, also at a senior level. Um, and we got through that difficult period by, we go back again to good communication and openness and um, telling people early, um, managing expectations, I suppose, is the... Um, is the terminology, so not promising a, a timescale that wasn't backed up by reality, uh, and then actually being able to um, bring the various parties together. Um, cross words are spoken, and that's important. Uh, we've all been through that in uh, professional and private lives, but making sure that through all of that, the outcome was good for everybody. Um, so I, I remember that, I bear the scars, um, but I'm also reassured that the, the end result was very good. Um, so that's a sort of personal experience. Um, and I think that's probably quite a, a general truth that the communication and the openness is, is the most important thing. And, and sometimes the substitution of what was expected with something different. Uh, and then that whole community then has to be managed that what they were expecting to get is maybe a little bit different. Um, but Hopefully in time, you know, forgiveness is, is given and the honesty that's, that's um, taken place throughout that uh, then pays its, its dividends in the end. Mm -hmm. And Yes, yeah, so I, I agree. I think the communication is key and it's worth being absolutely clear about what it is your expectations are on both sides, but, but yeah. say it from, the, the, uh, from our side. Be very clear about it. Be very explicit about what you're expecting. And you know, double check that they, the, the partner has understood. It's, it's kind of like in any, in any uh, relationship, make sure that you've communicated it properly and that they have actually understood. So the, where, where there have been difficulties, most of the ones that I've come across have been ones where one side or the other thought they'd understood exactly what was going on, was doing their best to meet a set of criteria and in fact that wasn't what was expected and then suddenly you have you get to some deadline where there's a mismatch between what's been provided and what's uh, been expected and then you've suddenly got a panic while you try to mm. while you try to uh, sort it out the other thing i uh, we found very uh, helpful recently is uh, organize a, a formal lessons learned at the end of uh, a process. So we did that uh, at the end of the, uh, the recent DIRAC procurements. Um, and I, I won't go into any details. So we'd had various challenges, a lot thanks to the, the nature of the funding giving us artificial end of year deadlines, which make everybody more stressed. Um, and, but it was very interesting to sit down with the, the vendors afterwards, go through what had worked and, and do it as, as a kind of a process where you have a facilitator who isn't who hasn't been involved so do it in a very structured way but just agree at the we, we did this agree in advance everybody can say whatever they want during that kind of two-hour meeting get everything on the table and discussed and it's not about pointing fingers it is about if we had to do this again how could we have improved it mm -hmm. and sometimes you say well you know <laughs> the best way to improve it would have been for the funding to have been different Fine, okay, that, that's a good thing to know because at least then you all acknowledge the real problem was that. But there's lots of things that uh, we learned and uh, the, the vendors were very open to that and so I, mm. I think that I'd encourage everybody to, to do that with uh, the, the groups involved in the procurement. I think throughout the, throughout the process when you, when you work together you can also keep your eyes open. There is a very, I think now, now I see that there is, there is different red flags okay if you spot them you can at least look at them closely the first there's certain certain phrases you can watch out for example one of the phrases um here's the new feature can you test that okay that that is the thing where you have to be where i'm now always skeptical because that can often be a hey, very past 
it just do something and then you rely on the other side just leave me alone mm -hmm. to to fill that out sort it out um so if you if you spot in conversations i've just done that you have to test it or build that in here then this is usually it's not that good it would always be better if someone says well I, i've tried something out with the stuff you gave me and i think it fixes it i've checked that can you confirm that that would be a constructive thing so that's that's one of the things to watch out um the other thing that i'm always uh, which is a flaw to me is when people tell me oh yeah thanks for letting me know we're going to fix it in the next release or the next round or in, in a week's time then these these are the two red flags that i watch out and that they show me that something is not running as smoothly and constructive as it should be mm -hmm. or and then okay this is probably not everybody here will agree <laughs> the, the the last thing that i have if you report something that's not working well <laughs> And then someone comes back and says, yeah, I've written a brief reproduce or simplified version that shows that or, or, or shows that we have a fix for that. That's also something I'm, I'm getting more and more <laughs> anxious about because usually these small test cases and things that, you know, vendors want to simplify things to get to the essence of the point. But the, the final application usually is not that simple. And, and this always makes me nervous if people tell me, well, I've written a small demo or a small... That those are the three things I, I watch out. And following up on that, Tobias, I think it's, again, being very clear where you can and can't compromise. So it's something I've, I've had to get better at over the years is rather than having little flexibility built into your thinking, actually, so if there is scope in one of your benchmarks, to simplify it down and still have the essence. Be aware of that so that you know where you can uh, uh, help, but equally be very clear about why it is you can't, uh, you know, and, and we're, I completely agree, within our procurements, we're very strict on the, the benchmarks. They're the benchmarks we agree at the start and you, you can't simplify them, they are, they are required. And that's, that's an, an important part of the process. But we explain that right at the start and all the way through, we keep reminding everyone why we're doing it. So then that at least helps again on the communication side so that people aren't gonna come and ask, can we, can we do it a different way? Martin, yeah. Um, a lot of what's being discussed is, is very much in the context of a, of a hardware procurement. I'm aware also there's as major software procurements. I'd be interested to hear the views of the panel. How much of what is said is specific to hardware and is there anything different about a software procurement and how would that work? So maybe I'll throw that one to Alistair because I know you've had uh, experience, Alistair, with uh, uh, some companies where the software was the main thing being discussed. So would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I was I was going to say actually that we 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 don't do much software procurement. Most of what we do is free, but then but then uh, it's not not true in all cases. So so one piece of software that we we have uh, done a procurement for is our archiving software. So um, data management, data curation to put stuff onto you know and that sort of um, and what we looked at there is not necessarily a product with all the bells and whistles because you know 90 percent of them you won't necessarily use we wanted something that was relatively simple that that would do the job that had flexibility that that meant we could mold it to our needs uh, but also engagement from them in terms and a commitment in terms of um adding new features that, that we would request and that sort of thing and and that relationship over the years has actually worked very well you know we've 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 we found bugs they've been fixed for us that we've found new features that would be helpful for us and they've been um they've been in place now now it takes a bit of time because there's you know release cycles and all that sort of stuff uh, but sometimes we've actually had access to um beta releases and we've you know we've been given a a little patch that we've been able to apply and, and that has implemented this new feature prior to it being released because we needed it you know more urgently than the waiting for release and that sort of thing and that 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 has worked well um so yeah does that does that answer the question mm -hmm. i think i wanted to add as well um you know, your, your point is mainly about hardware but the hardware has a huge amount of software associated with it so the operating systems and and all of the debuggers schedulers etc and uh 
it's, <clears throat> I think, interestingly, um, promising future features uh, is, the, is the challenge because um, if it's a commitment, um, I, I now work for a software company that, um, Yellow Dog, which is a, a tiny company based in Bristol, and we do software to burst from on-premise into the cloud. And we're all about cloud now. But what I'm very well aware of is that all of the engineers are um, fully lined up over the next period of time to deliver new features. So um, if we're working with an organization and they want something special, it needs to be something that's going to be useful for the whole community. Um, otherwise, we'll go up a cul-de-sac and design something that's then different. So um, the reason I mention that is when, before I was with these big companies and the hardware and the software I, I did understand, but now I'm seeing it firsthand that uh, these are real people <clears throat> and they're all fully employed every single day. They don't have time to suddenly say, oh yes, I'll go and uh, you know have a, a look over here and play with something different. So. Um, having people like yourself, Alistair, who are willing to test and give you good feedback, we're doing that actively um, at the moment, and that's very beneficial because then you can um, predict bugs before they are a problem, uh, fix things, um, have, have a concept of what is going to be useful to work on, um, and have a more stable product, I think, which is, the, which is what everybody wants, isn't it? It's stable software that's not going to go wrong. Um, so sometimes I think the features, rather than promising it early and then having issues, it's to have them on a timeline that everyone's bought into and that you know when it's released it's going to be stable. Um, but thank you for doing the beta testing because someone has to do that <laughs> and provide the, the feedback. Marianne, I think, did you have... Yeah, there was an online question. Um, do the panel have any advice for those artificial end-of-year deadlines, especially if, as Fiona says, products are unexpectedly delayed? I think the, the, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a great question and uh, goes back to one of my early points, which is, um, is talking to us, the community, in plenty of time. Um, even if we know that it's going to be a short notice procurement, the more notice that we have of it, the better, because then we can have all the ducks lined up, um, all the people in the organization, all the approvals done so that people are available to work on it. Um, that's the best thing. If it's to do with the delivery deadlines, then I really have to defer to, uh, to Mark on that and, and how you manage that. So I think that, that's a good thing to discuss over coffee rather than to say <laughs> <laughs> state in, a, in a, a, a public forum like this. But yeah, if uh, the online people want to send an email, yeah, there are, there are things one can do. Um, but I think we should all be encouraging, I know the research councils aren't here now, UKRI are very aware of the problem um, and they do their best, so we have to, uh, we can't blame them. I think the more we can get the message across higher up the, the funding chain um, that this is really damaging um, because it's, you know, this year it's been impossible um, because of all the supply chain issues. But in any year, those, those deadlines add no value. They, they just create tension. They make it difficult. They also, they don't facilitate strategic planning, strategic thinking. And I'm quite sure we can find examples where, you know, the the wrong things had to be bought because there was no alternative. So we've managed to avoid it um, most of the time. But it, it's, you know, that that's not a it's not a useful thing. Yeah, I just I would I was going to say make a very simple point in terms of you know, sort of managing upwards. But I have observed recently actually there was some some slightly different approaches between different research councils. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, whereas some have been, you know, have been very, very hard line about it, others have actually been more flexible about as long as things, as long as orders are committed, then they're happy to honour that. And that may, they, and I don't know why that is, but there is certainly, there, are, there has been some flexibility there, or they, you know, with some councils. And, and one word I'll say you can Google is a vesting certificate, V E S T I N G certificate. That, that's something you might want to. Yeah, there are some workarounds that yeah. we. <laughs> I think Robin wants to come in on that. Robin? A quick comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree on, on influencing upwards. Um, I, I think that the UK is losing out with this in terms of its strategic positioning. I think that the, the, 
you know, there, there is a wider political point in this, which I'll, I'll, I'll avoid. But um, I, I think this goes, um, th this is at the level of research funding generally. So funding UKRI. Um, if you, you you see the length of the, the settlements that, that funding bodies are getting, then, you, you know, and, and um, these are of the order of, you know, one, three years, but these should be 10 year rolling strategies um, with, with regular commitment to government. And I think that, that that needs to change if we are going to be the science superpower that, that, that we do actually have the potential to be. Um, uh, it's probably not worth saying much more, but, but ultimately that's where we need to get to. So on that note, I think uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much to uh, the audience for your comments and questions, and thank you to everyone uh, on the panel, both virtually and here in person.